Lisbon, Portugal, November 30th, 1807. Nervous people gather in the driving rain, heading towards the docks to see if the rumors are true. They say Napoleon's troops have just entered the city and that the unthinkable has happened. Along the way, they pass posters hastily nailed up around the city. The ink is starting to run, but they can still make out the message. The house of Ragunza is fleeing. No, they don't believe it. That is until they see aristocrats trying to swarm aboard ships, while others call in vain for family members lost in the confusion. And even someone, partway through loading the royal library, has abandoned half the books to the rain on the dock. Then the crowd sees a group of ships already disappearing on the horizon. Ships that carry the queen and prince regent. Indeed, the whole court, abandoning the heart of their empire to flee into exile, attempting to reestablish its rule in its wildest and largest imperial territory, Brazil. This episode of Extra History is brought to you by all of our wonderful patrons over on Patreon. Thanks so much for your support. Though John VI was destined to inherit an empire, no one would call him a lucky man. He began his life with clear indications he'd lost the genetic lottery. Famously less than good-looking and often sick, there were times during his youth that it was thought he wouldn't survive. He was also unlucky in love, hustled into a political marriage with Princess Carlota Joaquina of Spain. Their marriage would be eternally unhappy. Wed by proxy when he was 17 and she only 10, he found he neither liked nor trusted her, suspecting she was a political agent of Spain. She, in turn, hated the Portuguese court, which was so religious and austere that women were not allowed to have social lives and theatrical comedies were banned. She considered her husband ugly, buffoonish, and jealous of her vivacious personality, and also she was totally a political agent of Spain. John was never supposed to be king, but when he was 18, his father died, followed two years later by his progressive and intellectual older brother. Then, two years after that, his mother the queen had a mental breakdown, falling into a deep depression and occasionally being unable to understand what was happening around her. Mental symptoms, which may have been a result of her incestuous ancestry. Yeah, sorry, we sort of skipped over the incest thing. See, John's father was also his mother's uncle. The House of Braganza was interesting. So here's John in 1792, suddenly being offered the role as prince regent to rule in his mother's stead, and he refused to accept. Because you see, under the laws of Portugal, if he died during his regency and his children were too young, his wife would become regent. And by this time, it was pretty clear that if Carlota got her way, she'd make Portugal into a Spanish puppet. His best option was to act unofficially as regent, relying on counselors for seven years until his kids got older, which just encouraged rumors that he was secretly mentally unstable as well and unable to take the reins. And this wasn't a great time for rumors of weakness because revolution was sweeping Europe. The American colonies had broken away, and in 1793, France executed its king. Then, Portugal joined Spain and Britain in a political bloc to invade France, but were defeated, resulting in Spain switching sides, all of which left John in a political box. Allying with Spain and France would make political and military sense, but Portugal was now economically tied to Britain. So his answer was a careful policy of neutrality, balancing France against Britain, but that quickly collapsed. And then, in 1799, he finally accepted the official regency. But then another player appeared on the scene, Napoleon Bonaparte. And he had had it with Portuguese neutrality. When John didn't commit to an alliance with France, Napoleon backed a brief Spanish invasion that lost Portugal's several border areas and part of Brazil to French Guiana. But still, John refused to give up the alliance with Britain. And in fairness, he didn't really have much of a choice. Join Napoleon, and he'd probably bankrupt his country, as well as make the passage to his lucrative colony of Brazil incredibly dangerous, or join Britain, and France would invade. And as if these years of seesawing interests weren't enough, he also discovered a plot to remove him, centered around none other than his wife. Dun dun dun! But in 1807, the dam finally broke. France officially announced its intention to invade, and it was clear that the Portuguese military couldn't stop them. Now, Prince Regent John had a few choices, but none of them were good ones. And rather than end up a puppet king or under house arrest, he decided to dust off an old contingency plan that had been kicking around for decades. He, his family, and the entire court would board ships and evacuate to Brazil, which they'd fashion into a new imperial capital. It was a mess. John and his family boarded so fast that everyone but Carlota and two daughters went on a single boat. A dangerous prospect, since if the ship was lost, it would wipe out the royal family. Also, hectic preparations meant ships went out overloaded with passengers, but short on food and water. 
Families got separated, and some aristocrats had to abandon their luggage to make it in time, boarding with nothing but the clothes on their backs. This chaos on the dock led to problems at sea. The overcrowding was so bad, food had to be strictly rationed, and some of the most powerful people in Europe had to sleep on the open decks. An outbreak of lice forced many women to shave their heads, and for two torturous weeks, they were becalmed in the middle of the Atlantic. Meanwhile, the inhabitants of Brazil gathered to receive the royal couple with an air of understandable excitement. This was the first time ever that the European royals visited one of their colonies. Oh, and you know, they'd just seen all the portraits of Prince Regent John, his princess, and the queen. They were pumped. Thus, it was a little awkward when they met the couple and found out that not only had the portraits somewhat generously portrayed them as more attractive than they were, with fewer facial warts, but they were also very much worse for wear after the voyage. The Braganzas, by contrast, saw a world they could scarcely imagine. Rio de Janeiro was nearly two and a half centuries old at that point, yet it still felt like a frontier port. Streets were unpaved and muddy, and it was small, unable to house the thousands of courtiers that came in on the flotilla. No matter, the royal family moved into the governor's mansion, using the attached jail as a servant's quarters. And if any government official or court figure or, you know, just a royal friend or relation needed housing, they just seized it on royal authority and booted out the current occupant, which, as you can imagine, made them super popular. In fact, some homeowners avoided this fate by knocking down a few walls, laying timber around, and claiming their house was under renovation. Renovations that somehow just never seemed to stop. But as the citizens of Rio pretended to renovate their houses, John went about renovating Rio. First, he declared it the new seat of the empire, removing all of the restrictions it had suffered under as a colony. Previously only able to trade with Portugal, Brazil could now send its sugar, coffee, and gold to other markets, particularly the United Kingdom, which became its most lucrative partner. John also established a working government and elevated the prestige of local churches. But most importantly, he established new cultural, artistic, and scientific institutions, such as theaters, a royal botanical garden, and several universities focused on mathematics and natural science. And that last one was big, since those subjects were not allowed to be taught at a university level in the colonies. He was essentially changing Brazil from a backwater colony set up for nothing but extracting wealth to a territory that could stand on its own as a nation. But there was something else that was different about Brazil. It wasn't just the muddy streets or rough buildings that struck them as they got off the ship. It was the large number of enslaved Africans. Brazil was the largest slave society in the Americas, the recipient of 40% of all people kidnapped, enslaved, and transported from Africa. In its history, Brazil imported four times the number of slaves as the United States or Haiti did, and nearly every aspect of their economy, from sugar and coffee production, to gold mining, to how the rich got around cities carried on palaquins, involved slave labor. And that would increasingly cause friction with Portugal's greatest ally, the United Kingdom, which banned the slave trade the same year John arrived in Brazil. So there, in a backwater colony, with an economy based off perpetuating crimes against humanity, John built his new court. But what he didn't know was that he was also founding an empire. You know, one of the main reasons we're able to make episodes of Extra History like the one you just watched is thanks to the generosity of all of our fantastic patrons over on Patreon. Now, if you'd like to join our Patreon community, not only will you be helping us create the content you love, but you'll also have cool options, like suggesting and voting on extra history topics, viewing all of our shows early, accessing our lovely official Discord, snagging some exclusive 4K wallpapers and never-before-seen digital posters, and tons more. Just take a look at the tiers and see what tickles your fancy. But no matter if you want to help forge the future of extra history, join an awesome community, or are just passionate about learning, please consider supporting our channel by clicking the card right up here. And if you do, you'll be joining the awesome ranks of Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Musja, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, Kyle Wooldridge, and O-Reels1, who are all fantastic legendary patrons. 